This video is for people who've been diagnosed with Graves' disease and hyperthyroidism. They're typically given a very narrow range of options from the conventional medical doctors. And then when you research what's available in natural health, there are really very few people in the natural health field who have much experience um, with Graves' disease. There's a lot of general advice about what to do for overall wellness, but it doesn't seem that there are many people who have really seen Graves' disease patients or know what to do with them. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about the basics of Graves' disease and hyperthyroidism, what options there are when seeking conventional treatment, and then some advice on how to navigate the world of natural treatment. The point of this slide is that hyperthyroidism is serious. If someone's coming into my office with hyperthyroidism, then generally I see them having probably all of those symptoms on the left side of this chart. Heart palpitations, heat intolerance, muscle trembling, weight loss, fatigue, hair loss, anxiety, nervousness. And there's a lot of good general health advice online and some of it, you know, is directed towards Graves' disease. But if you're having these symptoms every day and it's this severe, you need specific help for your immediate situation. You know, being told to go gluten-free and to make some um, vegetable juices or smoothies, that can be really good general health advice. And every once in a while, you're going to find the person where that's all that they need. But generally speaking, that's probably not specifically what someone needs, or if it works, it'll take a long time. In the meantime, they're going all around with these symptoms. And if someone doesn't stay on top of hyperthyroidism and treat it appropriately, they can go into what's called the thyroid storm. This is an acute aggravation of hyperthyroidism symptoms. It's not so common now as it used to be, and that's because it's associated with uncontrolled and untreated hyperthyroidism. And even if acute symptoms don't flare up that bad, there are serious long-term symptoms to having uncontrolled hyperthyroidism. And this is osteoporosis and cardiovascular disease, specifically cardiomyopathy. So after getting diagnosed, you're going to have these three general treatment options. The conventional route, natural route, and then there's the self-treatment. Um, these are not necessarily mutually exclusive. You can go to the endocrinologist, get medications that control symptoms, and then work with someone else in natural health to figure out what the underlying issues are. But I want to make the point that the um, self-treatment, there's a lot of that out there, and it's better than nothing. But just because someone with hyperthyroidism made a YouTube video saying that they got better doing some juice cleanse or something like that, that's good general health advice, but it's not necessarily going to be exactly what you need. And the concern is that someone might be doing the self-treatment because they don't want to take the medication and things may not be as under control as they think and the next thing you know that there's a flare-up, they go into the emergency room and then they're going to just end up right back on the medications anyway. Going from the conventional route, you're going to see these two general options, medications and procedures. As far as medications go, the most common one is methamizole, also called tapazole. And that's simply a drug that suppresses the thyroid's ability to make thyroid hormone. If they can't use that because either it doesn't work or often in pregnancy, they'll use another drug called PTU. If there are many cardiovascular symptoms, then they might prescribe beta blockers, usually for panel. The other side of this equation that they have is hope. Because they know in certain situations, Graves' disease will spontaneously resolve itself. It'll just kind of go away. They don't know why that is, but they know what happens at times. So what they're hoping to do is suppress thyroid function for a while, and then maybe someone could slowly get off and they won't have hyperthyroidism anymore. And if this doesn't happen to work, then their next plan is to destroy the thyroid. That could be RAI, radioactive iodine. Occasionally it might be surgical removal of the thyroid. They're usually not going to do that. If you have um, the Graves' eye disease and bulging around the eyes, then they might do some type of surgical correction to move the eyeball back into its socket. From a natural perspective, we do have some supplements and herbs that are very good for hyperthyroidism. Um, bugleweed is the most common, lemon balm, motherwort's a little bit more specific for the heart. Let's see, lithium, uh, this is low dose lithium orotate, not lithium carbonate, um, carnitine, selenium. 
So all of these are helpful. In some cases, they may be more helpful than in other cases. The point is that, that while these do work at controlling hyperthyroidism, this is not the overall treatment. If you're seeing someone who's truly qualified, if you're seeing a good naturopathic doctor or someone else in natural health, the goal should be towards improving your health. The goal should be to figure out why your body is producing hyperthyroidism to begin with. Because as far as I'm concerned, if the overall treatment plan is to use bugleweed instead of methamizole, then you're basically doing the exact same thing as the endocrinologist. You're giving something that momentarily is going to suppress thyroid hormone, and then you're hoping it'll just go away on its own. And otherwise, if it doesn't, eventually the person can just have um, REI and have the thyroid destroyed. So for people not comfortable with the conventional options, these are some guidelines I have for how to select a practitioner in natural health. First of all, they should be comfortable working with autoimmune disease. And also, they should do a sufficient intake to treat you and not your disease. You shouldn't go into a natural health care practitioner, I don't care what their degree is, whether a naturopathic doctor or a chiropractor or whatever, and have a five minute consult and walk out with a bunch of supplements. How are they knowing what's going on if they didn't even do an intake? Also, um, they don't necessarily have to have experience with Graves' disease. Now, did that sound unusual? Now, I think experience with Graves' disease helps because you have more experience maybe using the supplements or herbs that are specific to it. You might know what works better in one situation or another. But ultimately, you want someone who's comfortable with autoimmunity who's going to treat you. Because in the long run, if someone is working on you and your health and your health is improving, that's your best chance to get over this. What they shouldn't do, and everything here on this slide is here because I, I've spoken to many Graves' disease patients who have also told me about their experience with other practitioners in natural health. Um, if you go to someone with Graves' disease, they should not assume that you have Graves' disease because of poor gut health. Yes, poor gut health can contribute to autoimmune disease, and it is a consideration of Graves' disease. However, that doesn't mean it's the only consideration. And also, it doesn't mean that just taking a bunch of probiotics and glutamine or whatever is necessarily going to fix the problem. A lot of times it's a parasite, to be honest, and you have to specifically go after it. Um, things that they shouldn't do, high-dose iodine. I, I've seen this at times. I, I don't know why, except my best guess is that there is not a lot of education around Graves' disease, but iodine is something people know to do with thyroid conditions. So they just fling a lot of iodine at people with hyperthyroidism. Iodine is used by the thyroid to make thyroid hormone. If someone is already making too much thyroid hormone, why do they need to take more iodine to make more thyroid hormone? I, I do not give people iodine who have hyperthyroidism. Um, something else, they should not use lithium as a monotherapy. I've seen this on um, YouTube presentations or people talking about curing Graves' disease with lithium. Um, lithium is very good at helping people with hyperthyroidism. It, it's not a monotherapy and lithium deficiency is not known as the cause of autoimmunity. Although lithium deficiency may be a problem in some people, so it's fine to include this as a therapy. But again, the person needs to do an intake and treat you not just be like, I'm the iodine dispenser, I'm the lithium dispenser. And just finally, they should not use only hyperthyroidism supplements. Um, you don't need to go to a practitioner to be told to take bugleweed for hyperthyroidism. Um, you could just try that on yourself. Every once in a while, it makes someone a little bit more hyper. So it only works for some people. For, some, for those people who it does work, it works exceptionally well. It doesn't necessarily going to work for everyone. It's not the best herb for everyone with hyperthyroidism. But if the only thing someone's going to do is just say, like, well, here's some general supplements for hyperthyroidism, um, you don't really need to go to a practitioner to do that. Some treatment considerations that I have if someone comes in with hyperthyroidism is it might be related to allergies. They might need to change their diet. A gluten-free diet or, or celiac disease that might be um, going on, not always. There are many people who remove gluten from their diet and don't get well at all from whatever problems they have. That's because um, gluten sensitivity and celiac disease is not the cause of all illness. 
it's a cause of many illnesses. It, it's good that we're more aware of it now, but removing gluten from your diet is not guaranteed to remove autoimmune disease. But it's a consideration. I, I remember just throwing that out there because um, in the last couple of years, gluten-free has become um, this big thing in natural health. And it should be a concern. It, it's just not going to cure everything by telling them to go gluten-free. Um, parasites are a big consideration. There's um, many people where it's an amoeba or something like that. If I suspect parasites, I recommend testing for it and then going through a sufficient protocol to get rid of it. Because um, honestly, if someone comes to my office and they say, oh, I did a parasite cleanse on my own, my real response would be if I suspect parasites is to test for parasites and then if I see something, then either refer out or, or work on it with herbs depending on what it is. I'm not going to be like, oh, you took some random parasite protocol and you're only guessing it's a parasite and I'm just going to assume it worked. Um, because um, with parasite plans, um, sometimes you can get rid of it with herbs, but you have to go high dose and you have to give the right ones for the person. Um, heavy metals and other toxins, that can be a big trigger of um, inflammation. Acute infections and stealth infections, I look for um, those in autoimmune disease. Of course, emotional stress can contribute to just about any condition. The other thing here is anything else that makes sense considering your personal health history. So I always go through people's complete history and work on their health and wellness, not going off of some protocol. And that's exactly what a naturopathic doctor is supposed to do, and that's the type of treatment that people are supposed to go to naturopathic doctors for. So there is no such thing as a Graves' disease protocol. Um, that picture there is a hammer trying to knock a square peg into a round circle. You don't want to go to a practitioner who's doing that. And as much as this video is up here to encourage people to seek out qualified natural health care practitioners instead of just doing the self-treatment from some random websites or what some other people put up on YouTube, I, I also kind of dismayed at many of the stories clients have told me about what other practitioners with Graves' disease have told them to do. And a lot of it is trying to bang this square peg into a round circle. So I went over the basics of what they do. They give high amounts of supplements that are supposed to be for Graves' disease without really doing much of an intake. And um, it's kind of annoying to, to hear this. But there, I know there are also many very good practitioners out there. And I want to encourage people to see them. Um, sometimes Graves' disease may be misdiagnosed. Maybe you have hypothyroidism, but you don't have Graves' disease. There could be hypersecreting nodules. There could also be acute thyroiditis. And this can change um, dramatically what treatment you need from especially a um, natural perspective. It's important to show any new practitioner all the labs you have gotten. That includes TSA, T3, T4, CBC, thyroid peroxidase, and thyroid is stimulating immunoglobulin. Those are the um, antibodies for autoimmunity. Fortunately, many times doctors will get lab reports back and don't really look at them. That, that's the impression I get because so many times people will tell me, well, this lab is normal or blah, 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 and it's not normal. Or actually, what's much more common in hyperthyroidism is incomplete sets of labs being run an inability to interpret the labs. I have another video that I made a couple of years ago on interpreting labs for hyperthyroidism and Graves' disease. So um, that's something I would encourage people to watch if they want more information on, on what labs they need and how to interpret them. Okay, um, that's it. Bye.